go, go. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, okay, so Dave and I are here to discuss the, uh, the WIST 2 in a Box uh, project. We're going to provide some background and, uh, and context as well as what led us up to uh, creating this project and give you an overview of what it's all about, why we're, why we're working on it and what the future holds. This is a very exciting time for the WMO and for International Weather, Climate and Water Data Exchange and we're going to tell you all about it and the exciting things that are, uh, that are, that are planned with uh, heavy integration of FOSS and phosphor g So this is a revolutionary time, and I hope you guys enjoy the presentation. I'm just going to turn it over to Dave. OK, thank you, Tom. So we thought we'd start with some context on the WIS2 box and background. So the WIS is the WMO information system and a system used to exchange weather data between WMO member states and used in weather forecasting, amongst other things. Uh, in looking at the context, I think it's always useful to go back in time to look at the origins of the international data exchange, uh, interoperability, and things like that. And in the weather context, this can really be traced back to the 1850s, where they looked at exchanging um, standardised weather observations over the oceans to then make weather charts, sailing charts over the oceans. Uh, as an oceanographer, I'd like to remind the meteorological community that we were there first with the oceans, and that the weather came later. Um, and in 1873, we had the International Meteorological Organization formed to further coordinate this exchange of data, uh, free and open exchange, standardization, interoperability, and all of those good things. And I think this helps set some of the context for what we're doing and that there's been this ecosystem develop over a long time period. Uh, and this data exchange has evolved from under the International Meteorological Organization and now under the World Meteorological Organization. Uh, some key dates to note are the development of the World Weather Watch. So this evolved from the um, start of the satellite era and Earth observing era and truly global coverage for weather observations. Uh, to help exchange the data and high large volumes of data, we had the global telecommunication system implemented and developed in the 1970s. And so this was a network for exchanging weather observations prior to the internet. And this system is still in use today. Um, and it is a closed ecosystem. Uh, a simple uh, circuit diagram there showing um, the message switching circuit in its full glory. And so in recognition that we needed to be more open with the exchange of data, we had the first WMO information system developed in around 2007 starting to use web technologies, web methods. However, with um, change in technologies and time, um, we're looking at the second version of the WMO information system now, looking to use more open standards, so the OGC, W3C standards, looking at open source software, trying to make it as open as possible, looking at data sharing through the web, um, using pub-sub methods to advertise data, make it available to the interested users making sure that what we develop is cloud ready and can be deployed either in the cloud or on premises and then making use of web APIs um, to provide access to the data and services. Um, from this work there's been effort in specifying the architecture which I've tried to illustrate on this next slide showing the concept of global services so a global data catalogue, a global data broker, global cache, um, feeding data to the users and then feeding into the global services, we have a series of WIS2 nodes, which are essentially the national weather services, uh, collecting the data from their weather stations, uh, converting it to the required data formats for use in the operational forecasting. When those data are ready, they notify users going through the global broker that the data are ready, and the users can then go and either get the data directly from the WIS2 node or from the global cache. And here we're talking about very large volumes of data which is part of the reason for the global, uh, global services, and it's all event-driven. In, in developing this system, we've had a series of demonstration projects looking at different aspects, so looking at the data set di discovery, how we do the catalogue services, looking at the data exchange to looking to see whether the pub-sub method and subscription and downloading works. We've looked at the different Earth system domains, so not just the atmosphere, but the cryosphere, the oceans. 
And importantly, we've also been looking to support the less developed countries and small island developing states to make sure we leave no WMO member behind and that what we develop here works for those countries as well as the bigger, more resource-rich countries. Uh, one of these projects was working with Malawi, which I'm going to talk about now for the next couple of minutes. So looking at a demonstration project, improving the observing network and exchange of data from those stations. So essentially, uh, we had a system where uh, we had a number of stations making only two or three observations per day, a few making four. This wasn't really suitable for modern weather forecasting, where we need early observations ideally. There were issues with the data transmission um, and things like that. So, and so the Malawi project was born to try and improve this system. I'm just going to skip over this next slide and move on to the solution we developed. So here, in this case, making use of Amazon Web Services, looking at the data from the weather stations coming in via SFTP in this case, and there were um, constraints on the observing network that we were working with, so this had to be via FTP. Uh, as part of this, from the FTP server, we then had event-driven data transformation to the buffer format, which is expected by the weather forecasting centers, but we've also done a buffer to GeoJSON converter uh, to work with the web APIs and make it more accessible to other users. And this is all then accessible through um, Python R, QGIS, even Excel, and Tom will say more about this later. Uh, in doing this work, we've come up with several open source uh, software developments, the first of which is a converter to the buffer format. I won't say much more on that today unless anyone is interested, but come and see me afterwards. More interestingly, we've also got the buffer to GeoJSON converter. So there's a lot of buffer data out there available and if you know where to look, you can find it with the real-time weather observations. But it can be difficult to use, so we've got our buffer to GeoJSON converter. Uh, this is also a requirement for the open APIs and web technologies we're using, and it should be able to work with most, with nearly all observational buffer data to convert to GeoJSON. We've published this as um, all on GitHub under the Apache 2 license, and I should flag that we make heavy use of the EC codes library from ECMWF. A quick illustration of the implementation. So we have our CSVs coming in, station metadata, giving contextual information on height of sensors, types of sensors, a template to map to the buffer format, the conversion to buffer, a user unfriendly binary format, and then conversion to GeoJSON for use in the WIS2 box. And overall, this has improved the access to the observations and availability of those data from Malawi, and we're then this work has then turned into the WIS2 box, opening up access to many other users. And with that, I'll pass to Tom. Thanks, Dave. So how do you move forward uh, based on a point-to-point, -point, private, bespoke net networking system and try to modernize uh, international weather, climate, and water data exchange? The answer to that is working uh, more in the open. Um, and that means open standards and reference implementations of open standards using op free and open source software. So uh, I will, I will uh, quote Cliff Cotman, uh, interoperability doesn't happen by accident. Um, and that's uh, very true. And that's something we've really taken to heart in this generation of WMO Data Exchange. So I'm just recanting some of the history uh, that, that, that Dave mentioned um, that led up to the inception of the wis box project, which started in, uh, which started in November. Um, for, uh, uh, for a reference implementation for data exchange. And that's available free open source. For, for We want it available for all members. So what is WIS2 in a box? It's a reference implementation of a WIS2 node. So a WIS2 node is a, is a specific component of the architecture we're developing as part of the next generation WMO information system. Um, the core components of, uh, of WIS2 box are PubSub, or MQTT for that matter, in this case. Uh, weather data does not happen on a cron, is a very event-driven uh, domain, so uh, we are making heavy use of, uh, of uh, published and subscribed technologies, and obviously H HTTP. wis in a box is software, it's not hardware. You can't buy the box, um, you have to, it's software, you install it, and then it works on, uh, it works either on-premises or, 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 or on the cloud. 
So it's basically a reference implementation of that part of the architecture. The things that we do with WIS2 box. So it's plug and play, not plug and pray. It's based on uh, international standards, heavy use of OGC standards here, and that's built in from, uh, from the bottom or, uh, or from the start, as well as ISO and W3C standards for that matter. Uh, again, on-premises or cloud uh, uh, capabilities. We have a data exchange uh, um, um, capability in, in WIS2 box, so you can fit, you install the box, you hook up your, your real-time data feed or uh, your non-real-time data feed, and it sort of runs through the box. There's an ingest, and I'll, I'll walk through some of the, uh, the workflow later, but data exchange is a big piece. Data visualization is a, is a big piece, um, looking at data through graphs or, or, uh, um, or maps, and, and weather data is very, uh, Weather, climate, and water data are very exciting, but you know this. Uh, I don't have to tell you guys. When you put data on a map, something happens, and that's what is happening here in this next generation of of WMO and 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 phosphor G for that matter, and geospatial discovery is a big piece, obviously, both uh, discovery from a, a, a user perspective in the community as well as a mass market perspective, as well as monitoring. We are totally open, again, based on open source. I can't show this slide enough. Um, as well as free and open source standards. So you'll see some of the usual Phosphor-G suspects in the, on the uh, free and open source software slide, and we're, uh, we're pretty happy about that, and uh, uh, there's uh, nothing proprietary here. Everything is out in the open, and uh, that's how we, we, we choose to operate and make, uh, make things available. So open source implementation of open standards of which WIS2 is based on these open principles. In fact, being open is a principle of WIS2 that was defined uh, uh, a few years back. In the WIS2 architecture, we have um, uh, the idea of core services and compliance services. So core are the things you shall do as a member state, uh, as a member, and the optional things are things uh, you should do uh, or may do for that matter. So the core services, again, are PubSub, um, using the web and uh, using both of those to either subscribe to data, download data, or make your data available through, um, through events to the, uh, to, to the infrastructure. The optional services are, are APIs, and uh, we allow uh, uh, OGC APIs as well as other well-defined uh, APIs, and we make heavy use of that in WIS2Box as a result of that decision from the architecture team at, uh, at, at WMO. Simple workflow. Um, the whole idea is in WMO we have, uh, WMO has also revamped their data policy uh, which, which uh, forces members to, to provide data in a more openly available manner for what we classify as core data. So that with the core, all WMO core data shall be free and unrestricted and that is driving a lot of the, uh, the, the WIS2 work. So the whole idea there is that core data is made available to global services and those global services from those central services such as we'll have global broker services, global caches and CDNs of, of real-time weather and climate and water data will be made available through those global services for anyone, whether you're in the weather community or whether you want to build a, uh, a weather application. Again, the, uh, the, the unified data policy is, is pushing a lot of that. Um, we also have a, uh, we have a, a core capability in the, in the unified data policy, and we also define recommended data, because we do realize some data uh, it will, it is not designed to be uh, open. Um, so for that data, there is a, a, an idea of uh, access control in the, uh, in the architecture, and we make that, uh, uh, we make that a reality in WIS2Box itself. So there's a lot of flexibility. The other part where uh, um, WIS2Box helps as an implementation is this, it could support national or regional data exchange. So in addition to providing your data to WMO as, a, as an agency, you can also set up WIS2Box and do a regional data sharing if you wanted to do uh, um, you know, more local data sharing without, uh, without necessary, in addition to going, going out to uh, WMO Global Services. Here's what the whole thing looks like from an architecture perspective. So WIS2Box is obviously in the, uh, in the navy blue, 
and uh, it's designed to, again, publish, subscribe, support, publish, subscribe, and download of weather and climate water data. And it's, uh, it's mass, market, uh, mass market friendly, so it'll work with search engines, it'll work with GIS applications, it'll also work with the decision support tools that we're familiar with in the, uh, in, in the domain, such as forecasts or workstations and so on. So not only are we trying to satisfy the, um, you know, the domain, but we actually want to fan out and, and, and serve the mass market and maybe the, the people beyond our community to reach out to them and, and make better use of, of this data. We have two concepts in WIS2 box. We have a design time concept and a runtime concept. So when you install the box, you basically run a couple of design steps to set up your, your metadata and hook up your data feeds and configurations. And that you can see in the blue. And everything after that is runtime, which means you don't touch it. So you, you configure it, you set it. Um, maybe you don't forget it, but you let, you let it run and uh, it does its thing and the engine turns and then it contributes to, uh, you know, cont contributes to the, the data exchange. What happens? I'll walk you through an actual workflow. Uh, so a data file will arrive in WIS2 box. We identify the data. So there's an idea of uh, a topic category in, uh, in, in the WIS2 architecture, which is a, you know, a very deep classification scheme on what kind of data this is and, and who it's coming from and, uh, and, 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 and so on. So that goes to an identification step. We have a data pipeline step, which is extensible. So all of WIS2 box is built on a plugin architecture. So uh, organizations may want to implement their own data pipelines to deal with their own data formats and turn and, and, and basically write those, it's, uh, write those and, and, and integrate those into the box. After data runs through the pipeline, it's published to a web accessible folder, which uh, then a notification is made to uh, using PubSub and MQTT to, uh, to WIS2 global infrastructure. We also publish data to the API. So, um, that gets made available through an OGC API. Then the user on the right will subscribe to the uh, PubSub and get a notification back that the data is actually there and, and, and do what they have to. So a few screenshots. Um, here's an here's a early iteration of, uh, of what we're working on. So you know, very basic map. Uh, uh, this is all driven by OGC API features and, uh, and other standards. Here you can see some of the GeoJSON that Dave was uh, referring to. So we obviously support that through the OGC API. Um, you can use this in QGIS. You can even use it in Excel for, uh, for, for better or for worse. But the idea here is that we've lowered the barrier. We've lowered the barrier to, to access the data using the open standards. Phosphor G. Um, Phosphor G is sprinkled uh, in many places on the project. So here's our software stack. You'll see use of uh, PyGeo API. PyGeoMeta, um, OWSLib, we've discussed some of these uh, uh, d during the conference. So they've been useful in helping us set up this entire, uh, this entire box, as well as some other uh, technologies there, leaflets there as well for the user interface. Here's a look at the architecture. Uh, basically, we have a data management component, which basically does the identification and the ingest and the processing and the registration. Everything is uh, S3 storage. We have an uh, using MinIO. We have a PyGeo API uh, application, which is do com container, which is doing the API stuff. We have a light uh, Vue.js and leaflet um, um, capability, and then we have we're using Mosquito for the PubSub. And there we can see how Phosphor G has infiltrated um, the, the WIS2 box uh, capabilities supporting the open, uh, the open standards. So we're pretty excited about uh, the project in and of itself in terms of where WMO is going with regards to being more open um, uh, in terms of data exchange and the idea of having a reference implementation to support the architecture. So a user can come and say, I want to see what this actually looks like if I implement it. And we can say, here, it's right here. Go download it and it's Python. And, if I can read it, anybody can read it. So uh, there's something to be said for that. In terms of a roadmap, we started in November. We're looking at a 1.0 by the end of the calendar year. In WMO, we're looking at uh, a pilot phase uh, uh, later on in this fall of a year between, all, between uh, various members to test the architecture, to validate the architecture. And uh, in, in, in 2024, we're looking at moving some of these things into production. So it is an agile, rapid, and iterative approach, which is really, uh, which is really nice and positive to see. And uh, WIS2 Box is moving along with the rest of the WMO architecture to, to provide this you know, out-of-the-box component to make this all happen. Again, totally open. Everything is on GitHub. 
uh, uh, it is a, a Apache 2 uh, Apache 2 license. We have a discussion uh, 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 issue tracker. There's a forum there for uh, for people to want to have uh, uh, discussions and so on. And we have our official docs at uh, docs.wis2box.wmo.int. With that, um, we're going to stop. We'd like to thank everybody for their uh, their interest in this presentation. Again, this is a really exciting time for WMO and Data Exchange, and we're happy that uh, we were able to present this to you today and here this week. Thank you, Tom.